Welcome everyone to this extremely special episode of Armenian Teletime. My name is Tristan Maradian. Um, I'm here as your host tonight. And I'd just like to begin by introducing our very wonderful guest. He's an investigative journalist, human rights activist. He's an author. Check him out online. You will see how many things he's been involved in over the years, what his family has been involved in. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here, Mr. Aramanukian. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you for having us, or having me, I should say. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about your book, which is coming out on April 24th, correct? That is correct, yes. And it's called Betrayal, The Promise Never Kept. And it's about the untold history of the Armenian genocide. So I just want to start by asking you, um, why did you spend so long, 10 years of your life, putting this together? What was your drive? What was your motivation for this? Well, this is kind of a, a family tradition, you might say. My grandfather, Shahan Natali, mm -hmm. who is one of the authors of this book because a lot of the content of, that's in this book is from his archive. And he was the mastermind behind the assassinations of the Turks who were responsible for the Armenian genocide and those Turks who had been prosecuted, found guilty, and sentenced to death but had fled the Ottoman Empire uh, before they could receive their just due. And so Shahan Natali, my grandfather, uh, organized Operation Nemesis, which was the operation which most famously Sohomon Telirian was a part mm -hmm. of and assassinated Talat Pasha as a result. What's, uh, is there any information that no one has ever heard that will be in this book regarding Operation Nemesis about what happened, the details? There is a lot of information of that nature. There's a lot of unpublished memoirs of my grandfather included, um, things that he went through, different meetings that he had that he documented, and then generally a lot of, a lot of documents that he collected over the years during that time newspaper articles, things of that nature, which have been forgotten. And they're a really important part of our history that we need to understand so we have a better understanding of what really happened back then. That, it's very interesting you bring up the documents and stuff, because a lot of times you, know, you hear stuff, but you, you never really get a chance to look at the actual physical document. A lot of times it's an analysis. How much of this book would you say is documents and analysis? Like, all these old newspaper clippings and stuff like right. that. Um, I would say 90% of this book is documents. And I can't even say 10% of it. It's 700 pages at the end of the wow. day. So I would say a very small amount of it is analysis. In fact, it's presented more as a document rather than me taking or my, my mother and I. My mother and I are the ones that have been working on this for 10 years and taking and giving our analysis because I think people can draw their own conclusions just by reading these documents. They really do speak for themselves. So someone reads this, what do you hope they get out of it? What do you hope they, they what clarity will they see? Well, I think what's most important is that we understand what caused the Armenian genocide. Why, why was it brought up I mean, there, there had been atrocities taking place in the Ottoman Empire for many, many years, since, since the Ottomans showed up, since the, the first sultan. You mm -hmm. know, we had our issues, and we've always had these little um, atrocities that have taken place over the years. You know, it's a, it's a history that goes back 700 years, six, 700 years of Armenians being subjected to looting, rapes, murders, and so on. But this one was very different. Starting in 1894, it, the whole thing changed. And the book documents a lot of things that will give the reader a, a better understanding of why it changed in 1894 as opposed to before that time when villages would be pillaged the, by Kurds and Turks and whoever. And then they would go away, and then they'd wait till the village becomes prosperous again. Then they go in there and go in for another cleaning. And my grandfather talked about that as a, as a child. He remembers mm -hmm. that that's what would happen. And in fact, in his story, his story starts in 1895 when his father is actually killed. His father, his grandfather, and 12 family members are actually killed, beheaded, and he saw all of this stuff. And he wasn't, his, his father wasn't expecting that. His father was expecting the standard, the Kurds will come, they'll take what they want, 
your mother will come later, she'll make bread for the evening that we've hidden, you know, flour that we've hidden, and then we'll all sit down for a meal and we'll, we'll rebuild our lives. It's not a big deal. It's just the way life is. But this time it was very different. And the book does really uh, show why it was different. So, and the word why is an interesting word, especially when it comes to the Armenian Genocide, because you discuss really why it happened and who really was involved in this. The story that we know is incomplete, as I, I've noticed. I've read your book two times, the preview already, which uh, everyone, if you'd like to see the preview of the book, you can find it online. Uh, is there a, an easy way that it can get to the, that? Probably the, well, it's not the easiest way. You've got to go through a couple clicks of, of links. But okay. if the easiest website to remember is www.snff.org forward slash betrayal, and that'll take you to the Shahan Natali Family Foundation webpage that's dedicated to this project. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a button there that says pre-order your book for $50. If you click on that, it takes you to an Indiegogo uh, webpage that, which has a very long web address, so it's easier to go through the, sure. the actual foundation website. And then you just scroll down to where it says mission, and there will be a preview button there of the actual book. And you can go and you can read a free preview. It's not the complete sample book. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the sample book. So, um, and it's only 77 pages. But it's 77 pages full of, of complete chapters. It has six complete chapters, uh, which will give the, the, the reader an understanding of some of those very influential powers that were involved in the Armenian Genocide. And, and definitely I would say people should check out, from, from what I've read, to me one of the most interesting and enlightening chapters I've read so far, so far, is chapter 26 about genocide recognition. Because there are things in there that are very important right now, and it's things that are happening right now that many are unaware of. So please, read it, read all 77 pages, and also make sure pre-order this book. This is gonna be probably, and I believe you, this isn't the only one that's on, on the line, right? This is this volume one. one. This is volume basically one. volume one. There's a lot, the archive we've barely even started to publish. This is a huge archive. It took, my, my mother did most of the preparing of the actual archive because there was a lot of translations that had to take place, and she was the most qualified to do that. She's, a, she's an information specialist. She has her PhD in information technology, and she's been a translator for many, many years, involved in different foreign languages, or international languages, she would rather, I say. And uh, so we're, she, uh, yeah, we're go gonna go to a quick commercial break. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay, so we're back from our break. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this book, Let's get into some of the interesting uh, facts that you've presented and you'd like to prove. Perhaps it's like a thesis in a way sure. that you're trying to prove. And what really caught my attention was that you'd like to say that Armenia had one-sixth of the world's oil reserve and that one of the main reasons why people were driven out and murdered was because of this fact. Yes. It wasn't simply for the land, it was something underneath the land. Right. So where did you get that information from? What, what documents, what started this? Well, in Shahan's archive and in other sources, I've come across newspaper clippings that talked about oil in Armenia and specifically naming Armenian cities where this oil was found. And the initial, one, the initial estimates were between four and eight billion barrels of oil uh, that were found on Armenian inhabited lands. And this oil, it's kind of interesting that this oil, the Armenians, you know, they've been, they've been trying to get independence and autonomy, mm -hmm. a state within a state even, within, within the Ottoman Empire, but, you know, Armenia. And there, there was actually a territory that was recognized by the world as Armenia. And it's been recognized in many treaties as Armenia. And we include that map, by the way. And it goes all the way down to Giligia. So there's actually borders that are, are drawn. And they do refer to that as Armenia. And in these newspaper articles, they're referring to it as Armenia. And mm -hmm. this is like Van and, um, I don't know, there's, there's, a, there's a whole list of these cities. And at that time, 
It doesn't say it in that article, but at that time, if you go to other articles, it talks about the oil reserves of the world. And at that, at that particular moment in history, there was accessible, it was believed that there was accessible 49 billion barrels of oil. Now you do wow. the math. 49 billion barrels of oil, and you take 8 billion of those, it's more than one-sixth, in fact. It's a little bit more than one-sixth of the world's oil. And in that time during our history, the Navy was converting from coal, which is what they mm -hmm. used to use to, to power their ships, to oil. And the reason being, coal, the amount of space that it takes on a naval ship, it will take a ship, in a, in, in a particular instance that they gave, it'll take the ship 6,000 miles. If you take that same area of storage and you put oil in, you can go 36,000 miles. So there's yeah. a huge advantage. You don't have to refuel. You can go all the way around the world and back, and you, you go on your, your oil that you mm -hmm. have in your ship. So you're, you're ready to go to battle, and you're not going to you know, stall at some point. So Britain, Japan... Italy, France, Germany, they all want, and the United States especially, all wanted oil. And in fact, in, during that period of time, the United States was one of the largest producers of oil, or they were the ones that were pulling the most oil out of the ground from the United States, which represented almost 70% of all the oil being used in the world at that time. Hmm. And most of it was being used by the United States, as it was. And there came a point where the United States wasn't able to produce enough oil, and they were actually importing oil from Mexico and so on. And there was estimates that the United States, at that rate of consumption, the United States themselves would run out of oil within less than 20 years. So they had to find other sources of oil, as were the rest of the world, looking mm -hmm. for other sources of this great energy source that they figured out, you know, burns. So they... Uh, the United States learned that the Ottoman Empire had this oil, and the way they learned, from what I understand, is that in part, I shouldn't say mm -hmm. completely, but in part the way they learned was the Armenians had been trying to find people to invest in mineral concessions, and one of the people that were involved in that process was Armen Garo. Oh. who was of Operation Nemesis. He was one of the people in Operation Nemesis. And he, in fact, had direct contact with Talat and the Young Turks and those that were involved in exploring for this, these resources. Yeah. And, and in fact, Armin Garo was the one who put together a comprehensive plan on how the oil and minerals could be exploited from the Ottoman Empire to make it profitable. No one could figure that out. He figured it out for them. He figured out the whole rail line system and how to transport and so on. That was Ottoman Garo's brainchild. Mm -hmm. And that's what attracted <coughs> interest, interest in doing this. Be I mean, they knew there was oil, but they just didn't know how they could take it out of the... the um, you know, uh, how to take it, transport it out, I should say, yeah. so it would become viable. And Ottoman Gato was the one that actually figured that out. And in fact, there's a book that somebody wrote that credits Ottoman Gato for being the one who was able to figure that whole thing out. Huh, that's, that's interesting. And I do have documents also of Ottoman Gato's uh, that he talks about this whole thing. And it's, that's included in the and book, And it's interesting. It's all, it seems to me, at least the 20th century and coming into the 21st, that so much uh, conflict revolves around the same topic, which is oil. Um, mm -hmm. And in this case, it was a, a, a genocide revolving yes. around oil. And, and the reason why I, I believe they drove the Armenians out were the Armenians had aspirations and they were pushing towards autonomy mm -hmm. of that region. The people that were involved in the world powers that were trying to get that oil were already in bed with Talat and company. And everybody knew that. And so if the Armenians had received the autonomy that they were trying to get and they had control over those territories, and by the way, that oil is found within Wilsonian Armenian, which legally speaking, even today, is rightfully Armenia's. It belongs to the Armenians. It's not um, part of Turkey. It's mm -hmm. occupied, basically. It's occupied. Because even though it was a part of the Treaty of Sers, that the condition was the land had to be determined who it's, who's going to get what, the arbitrary decision made by Wilson was not connected to a treaty. 
it was a decision which the Sultan, who had the ultimate power, and the Armenian government at that time, who was legit, they were legitimately and internationally recognized, mm -hmm. agreed that President Woodrow Wilson would decide the territories. And Wilson gave Armenia a much smaller territory than what they were asking for and what they were actually entitled to. That greater Armenia, not even greater Armenia, just the Armenia which had been recognized so many times as these territories, yes. Wilson didn't grant that. And I think one of the reasons why was one of the largest copper mines in the region and maybe even in the world was within the larger of the territories and those copper mines would pay for the entire concession of building all the rail lines, 2,800 miles of rail lines and transport and everything. Yeah. It would pay for it and then some. So that was really the key to guaranteeing that the, the project can go forward. And I have to add right here that the project eventually, which was known as the Chester Concessions, was for the benefit of the Americans. And it had all started in 1908 mm -hmm. at the instructions, the direct instructions of the then president, Theodore Roosevelt. So Roosevelt was behind trying to get the oil and trying to get all that stuff. And the Armenians get rid of them. Well, They're you mentioned problem. Mr. Uh, Chester, Colby Chester, correct? Yes. And he's mentioned a lot in this book, actually. Um, he's mentioned in multiple chapters. And from what I've gathered and from, from what you've been writing about him, um, this was one of the worst people in, in that time period when it came to uh, the treatment of the Armenians in his writings and, and the way he portrayed us and the way he uh, supported you know, the young Turks. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. There's quite a few of his writings that are included in the appendix of the book. And there, he had joined, for instance, he was a part of the National Geographic Society. And so he has a few very long-winded and very detailed um, accounts of Turkey in support of the Young Turks, making them seem like angels, and the Armenians making them appear to be parasites and exploiters and users and everything that Armenians were. His position was a rear, correct, rear admiral. He was a rear admiral, yeah. and he was, he met the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in 1900 when he went there allegedly to collect uh, monies owed to the United States government for losses that took place during the Hamidian massacres. Huh. And so he was able to collect those and he came in with the battleship Kentucky, which was brand new at the time. He comes in and he parks it basically outside of the palace of the Sultan and turns the cannons on the, on the palace. And then they, they go in, the Sultan greets them, invites them in, gives him a great time. He, he refers to it as one of the best times of his life. And later on, he returns in 1908. His good buddy, the Sultan, is there. At some point, he also arranges to have the US fleet stop by Turkey and pick up 12 naval cadets to go to Annapolis for training. So the US provided the, the Turkish Navy with naval cadet, or with, uh, with training. And then later on during World War I, Colby M. Chester tries to purchase a hundred interned German warships that the Americans had control over for the benefit of Turkey. He was buying them for Turkey. And there's an article, actually, I have a newspaper article where Colby M. Chester says that World War I was nonsensical. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. And how he could have prevented the US from ever going into the war if they had only allowed him to buy these warships. And these ships would have fallen into the hands of the Germans. Could you imagine what, what history could have changed right there? All of a sudden, the Germans have their 100 warships back in hand, thanks to Rear Admiral Colby M. Chester and the, and the Young Turks. So this is who Colby M. Chester was. Colby so, M. so he went against <coughs> the interests of the United States, would you say he, that? Mm, well, in a sense, yes and no. Because when you read into this book, you really start to see that there's a, a much bigger picture here mm -hmm. where maybe the United States manipulated World War I to weaken the world so they can become more dominant. Oh, that's That's where it, it comes down to. And there's an interesting uh, episode also in the book, and it's a chapter called Arming the Enemy, and it's it, an arms deal, which the, the Chester group, his group, actually ends up supplying 200,000 Mauser rifles with bayonets and 400 million bullets to the Turks in December of 1915, 
long after the Armenian genocide had started and the world knew these atrocities were taking place. They were arming the Turks. The Americans were arming the Turks. And all uh, these, I have all these documents. Uh, yeah, and, and these are all. This is all. This is not speculation. This is like documents. It's incredibly sad, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know that that you have. It, it's the. It's interesting. You don't want it to be true, but all the documents basically prove it to have been true. And we look at you know figures in our uh, history that we now kind of look at as heroes, like Ambassador Morgenthau. But he's not entirely clean, is he? Unfortunately, in the book, there's an episode that's, that's also documented. And it was in a newspaper article where Ambassador Morgenthau, I believe it was in 19, early 1916, maybe late 1915 again. He actually goes to New York, and he's talking about the Armenian Genocide. And then he has another visit with some businessmen um, who he's encouraging to invest in Turkey, saying, the Turks will remember those that stood by their side during this hard time and Turkey has a lot of wealth to be had. And he who stands by the Turks now mm -hmm. will be the ones that are rewarded later. And there was another thing that, that Morgenthau did, which I had actually originally heard about at a lecture about Morgenthau. It was a book presentation by Ara Sarafyan of the Gomidas Institute. And he talked about Morgenthau and how Morgenthau was tried to be benevolent in that he was trying to arrange to do a, a, a population swap and basically take Armenians from Armenia to Germany and take Jews from Germany and put them in the place of where the Armenians were. And so what I discovered was I actually discovered some documents and some writings within, within memoirs, other memoirs, and what the plan had been was, and I found a newspaper article also, by the way, um, Morgan, supposedly, Morgenthau had cleared with Talat Pasha to allow as many Armenians that want to leave Armenia to go to America. Oh. Just get out of here and yeah. go. And America will welcome you. And, <coughs> excuse me, this is, this is part of the, the I have a, 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 some writing in there about um, brain power being transferred. And there's been some, some talk about how the Americans actually wanted Armenians to come to America to build America because Armenians were very well known as being intellectual, um, industrialists, mm -hmm. resourceful, and so on. And that's what America really wanted. So you yeah. bring somebody, an Armenian, can you imagine, who's being prosecuted to the worst extent possible, facing death, and you welcome them into your country, what are they going to do? They're going to work their butts off. And they're going to do everything to please their savior, not realizing that their saviors are the ones that created that situation. So they had to flee Armenia to come to America. And what do they do? They build America. And that's how it works, is where you live is who's going to benefit from you, not if you work in America and send money back to Armenia. That's yeah. not benefiting anybody. That's benefiting the Americans still. That's, and that's a, a detriment to the Armenians. And that's what's happening today, by the way. So uh, Morgenthau arranged to supposedly have anybody that's Armenian wants to leave can go to America freely. Then there was a deal where they were going to take the, the Jews from Poland, and these were Jews that were already being prosecuted. They, were, they had fled prosecution from Russia mm -hmm. and so on. And they were going to transfer the Armenians to this desolate area in Poland from their native lands of Armenia and bring the Jews of Poland to Armenia to take their place. So this is what one of Morgenthau's uh, great services to Armenia was. Wow. It, I mean, nothing seems to be simple anymore the story the more you talk about it the more it just the the simple story it, it, it leaves my mind I can't even look at it the same way anymore there's so much power is working against us even the ones who we think are working for us are working against us uh, and we'll we'll continue discussing this right after this uh, short commercial break we'll be right back okay so we're back from our uh, commercial break and uh, we were talking about your book which is called betrayal the promise never kept uh, which is about the untold history of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, all the powers who worked against us, uh, all the characters, figures who we may even perceive to be our uh, friends uh, actually have you know, had a lot of uh, work with the Turks. And so uh, moving with that, I'd like to discuss 
what I saw was the, one of the most important uh, parts of this book so far because it kind of bleeds into the modern day uh, political spectrum a little bit, which is chapter 26, uh, Genocide Recognition. Um, and it really is about all of the organizations and figureheads right now who may, as back then as well, seem to be allies, aren't 100% with us, are they? What, who, who to you right now um, do you think is really not our friend, that we think is our friend? That we think is our friend? Those who are trying to gain United States official recognition of the Armenian Genocide and doing so and, and, our, and us supporting them in their political aspirations. And it's, it's not just one or two people, it's quite a few politicians that are doing this. Yeah. Um, for instance, those that have recently authored House Resolution 220, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in the book. Yes. Um, House Resolution 220 is for official recognition of the Armenian Genocide in one way or the other. But within House Resolution 220, there is actually an interesting line here, which, <coughs> well, that's the appendix. <coughs> well, I'm not gonna find it that quick. It's which about basically, a, whereas the uh, yes, Armenian Genocide. Whereas the Armenian yeah. Genocide is officially recognized by the United States government, and then it gives the examples of how it was officially recognized. I think uh, uh, President Reagan mentions it in a speech. President Reagan, the judicial system through, through a, a, a resolution that was passed um, it, within the House and the Senate, a joint resolution, and so on. Basically, all three branches of the United States government has officially recognized the Armenian Genocide, and it's written in, in if you look up on the internet right now, find House Resolution 220, and it's a, a, a work in progress right now. They're trying to push it through. It says in there, look for whereas the Armenian Genocide is officially recognized, and you'll see. And it's signed by 20 or so Congress representatives, including the Congress representative in our district here, Adam Schiff. And Adam Schiff has been one of the big pushers. In fact, in the book, in the beginning of, of chapter 26, it talks about Adam Schiff and how he's been pushing for genocide recognition. And recently, even, a newspaper article says Congressman asks, uh, asks government to recognize Armenian genocide. Well, the Armenian genocide is already recognized. And, and it's a question uh, that it's been recognized kind of undermines what's been done. Right. Well, the, to, to actually ask for recognition, yeah, to, to ask for recognition implies that it's not recognized. That's the whole point. Yeah. And why would, would somebody not want it to be recognized? Because I believe that everyone is waiting for official U.S. recognition so we can use the United States government to give a big push for reparations and reparations against the Turks. Well, the sad reality is when they start digging into reparations and who's actually responsible, which this book, which this book actually um, documents, mm -hmm. they're gonna find out that the United States has to pay reparations to the Armenian people. Because the United States at that time, and there's an article which I'm including also, again, Colby M. Chester, he's, he's gone through getting the concessions back in 1908, and then there's a bunch of countries that fight for those same concessions. Mm -hmm. Big battle going on behind the scenes of who's gonna get what, who's gonna get you know, this or that, and Chester is standing his ground saying, hey, fair and square, we got the concessions. Not only did the Sultan give us the concessions, the Young Turks then gave us the concessions also. And guess what, in 1923, it was ratified by the new, quote unquote, new Turkish government, which wasn't new. It was a continuation yeah. of the Young Turks. And in fact, many of the people on the cabinet, the prime minister, by the way, of the new Turkish government, he was one of the 12 naval cadets that went to Annapolis for training. He was the American, basically, prime minister to Turkey. He was the American's person. And so that cabinet stood behind the Chester concessions that said, it's yours, and they actually ratified it. They voted it in in 1920, I think it was July of 1923. Chester gets up and says, hey, listen, it's ours, and you know what? The war debt for World War I was $22 billion. But guess what? The oil and all the minerals that we're gonna get will far exceed $22 billion, excuse me, $22 billion. And it'll far exceed that. So 
the allies can't afford to pay us back. You know, like half of that, of that 22 billion, was debts that were owed to the United States government by other countries. And they said, they're all poor, but let's just take these concessions and we'll get our money back that way. And so they basically put a value on what they were taking from the Armenians, which were around 22 billion, if not more, dollars, not including all the suffering and whatever. If you do the calculations from then and now, Basically, the United States government, if they really received the $22 billion that was ours in minerals alone, just the minerals, I'm not talking about the human no, suffering, yeah. we're talking about today's value close to $1.5 tr uh, $1 $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. dollars. And that doesn't include the damages and the, the punitive damages and the pain and suffering and all that stuff. My estimate is we're looking at close to $5 trillion. Because we're, we're talking but just about the United States, right? We're just talking about the United States. Not even talking about Turkey. No, we're not talking about Turkey. But here's another interesting thing is most Turks, they were, they were involved, yes, but mm -hmm. they were just as big victims as we were in a different way to a cultural genocide. They lost their language. They lost their culture. They were modernized against their will practically and they were forced into this new culture. And since then, they've been all messed up because you know cultures really do correspond with who your people are. Yeah. And if it's artificially placed on you, it's like telling you know, a dog that they're a cat and making them act like a cat. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Their instincts, no. they, they don't have that, those instincts that a cat have. So I, I believe that yes, the Turks are very guilty of massacring the Armenians, and that was an act of genocide, and they do have to be punished for that, or they do have to recognize it, and they do have to make, make amends with the Armenians, and whether that be monetary, whether that be uh, a, a sorry, and so on. But I think the Turks have the right to also go after those that, that put this on them, because basically they were the tool. They were not, Turks were not capable of committing genocide. Turks were capable of looting villages, shooting up the villages, killing a few people, taking whatever there was, and then getting out of there and waiting for the, it's, it's like a harvest for them. Basically, mm -hmm. they go in, they cut the wheat, they wait for it to grow back, they cut it again. That's what the Armenians were for the Turks. They were their harvest. So, But this was just like, <coughs> removing the roots completely. This was removing the roots completely. This was really not beneficial to the Turks either because the Turks do recognize, and I, there's a chapter in here where there are actually Turks who are opposing all of the, the Armenian genocide, and they do say the Armenians are our backbone. The Armenians are our artists and our, our intellects and our whatever. They're beneficial to us. We need to take care of them, not destroy them. You know, of course, we take advantage of them, and we have been for so long, but that's just part of the culture. So basically, this book documents all that it also documents something very interesting, which was Germany. You know, we always talk about Armenian genocide being the first genocide of the 20th century. Yeah. It's not. The first genocide of the Armenian gen of the 20th century took place in Southwest Africa, and it was carried out by Germans in 1904 to 1909, and they they massacred an entire village, an entire region. They tricked the the chiefs to supposedly sell them coastal land. They use German meters of measurement, and a German mile is like five, five times more than a, an English mile. So they ended up selling five miles in from the coast rather than one mile in from the coast, which was non-usable land to them. It was all, you know, it didn't work for them. They needed the fertile land for their grazing, their cattle, and so on. And then they were subjected to the same thing that the Armenians were subjected to, and in the same exact way. So Germany- It's a parallel. It's, it's not just a parallel, because in 1883, the Sultan invited the Germans in to reform the army. The, and they ended up, the Sultan invited the, the Germans in to reform the army, and they ended up advising them what to do and how to do it. And I believe there's enough evidence, and there's even documents that we're including, again, from Germans, letters, correspondences, that, that implicate the Germans as being actually the backbone behind the actual genocide as far as carrying it out. And there's documents where the Germans were shooting the Armenians and killing the Armenians. In Gidika, there's mm -hmm. a, there, it's very well documented that it was the Germans that were actually uh, shooting down the Armenians that were resisting. You know, 
there's so much, and I'm, I'm even shocked that these 700 pages cover all that. Um, I have a, a couple questions about the book, just for the, our audience, uh, so that they know. Um, it's, does it only come out in English, or is there other languages? <coughs> Currently, it's in English, because okay. of economic restraints at this point. When we sell enough of these books, we're planning on translating into Armenian, because mm -hmm. Armenians really need to know their history. Yes. And so that's in the works, but we're talking close to $30,000 to get it translated into Armenian. It's 700 pages at the end of the day. So, but we also plan on translating into Turkish and into French and into the major languages, basically. Yes. So, because this is not an Armenian issue, this is a world it's issue. It's a world issue. It needs to be in Arabic. It needs to be in those languages which are read far and wide because people need to know what's really going on. And again, it could happen to anybody at any time. If a greedy, a greedy power wants what you have, doesn't matter who you are, mm -hmm. they're gonna come after you and they'll wipe your people out, they don't care. Greed is a different culture. And you know, some people say, oh, it was the Germans, it was this, that, the other, no, it was greed. It was because greed. there's a lot of good Germans, there's a lot of good Turks, even though a lot of Armenians will disagree, because that's the way that they were, you know, we were kind of brought up. But the reality is, is that it's greed that drives all of this. And Armenians are greedy too. And, and you know, um, discussing that fact and all that, you know, should we be more careful with who we trust, who claims to be friends, who claims to, you know, what the narrative is? This goes against the narrative to an extent because there's so much that, you know, they say it's re we need to recognize it, but we're saying, well, in reality, it has been recognized. What's the motive behind deceiving people now? What, what does that, what's, what are they hiding? What are they trying to lead to? Or are they even aware of that? I think that many people think that they're doing good in whatever they do. Sure. And whether that be an Armenian, whether that be a Turk, whether that be somebody from China, whatever, doesn't matter. People like to do good things. And even these representatives in Congress, they're probably, there's a good side to everybody. Sure. But the fact is that circumstances, there is also evil in the world. You know, there's temptations in the world. Well, look you at uh, Mr. Chester here. Yeah. I mean, he, he wrote an article talking about the unspeakable Turk doesn't exist. But, and that was right, right there, right? During the time where, or right before? It that, was, um, it might, it was, it was just before. Just before. It had to do with, it was trying to uh, fix up problems after Adana. Mm -hmm. That came up after Adana. And he talks about how the, everyone was together again and everyone was good and it's fine. Don't believe what you know, you're hearing type thing. And they, they, he benefited financially greatly from, from all that. Chester became one of the richest men in the world before World War II. Him and his two sons. Okay. And, and not just him, but bankers, uh, people along those Absolutely. lines? Absolutely. I mean, the banker who financed the, the exploratory um, mission to the Ottoman Empire, and I have all the documents from that, by the way. I have the actual reports. They were in somebody's private archive that they donated to a university. And it was actually financed by a banker named Jacob H. Schiff, who is actually related to Adam Schiff. And wow. this same Jacob Schiff, he not only financed that, he financed, during World War I, he financed the Bolshevik movement, actually before World War I even. And I have documents for that. <coughs> in 1903, he financed the uh, Russian-Japanese War, and he was awarded for that by the Emperor of Japan and credited for that. And there's even a newspaper article where he talks about how he did that and how that benefited him to indoctrinate Russians who were taken prisoner into to pulling off the Bolshevik movement. And it's in a newspaper article, which I'm sure he never intended to have printed. <laughs> in fact, Jacob Schiff and his whole group at that time, they were trying to control the news media. They weren't really able to, but they thought that maybe if they control 25% of the major news media, their names wouldn't get into the papers. Well, their names got into the papers into some ambiguous little papers here and there. Well, lo and behold, 
with technology, all of those papers have been archived and are available online. So you can actually discover a lot of things about them on these online newspaper archives today. You just have to know where to look and what, what keywords to put in. And I found a lot of newspaper articles. I've found thousands of articles, in fact. And, I've and that's them important. All. It's very it's important. It's important that we have everything documented so that no one can come at us, come at you, and you know, people who agree with this and say, you know, you're wrong, this isn't yeah. true, whatever. This is, Everything this is, is not, here. This is not a conspiracy no, theory. It's no. a conspiracy. That's all it is. It is what it is. The documents are there. They speak for themselves. I've always been, you know, people talk about different atrocities and they speculate, you know, you're a bad person because, but where's the, where's the evidence? Well, this one, in this book, it presents the evidence. And it prevents, presents the evidence more than an analysis, again. I tried not to analyze anything to the best of my ability. I do point out a few things to yeah. look at, but other than well, that, leave it's it up, really to, the up reader. to the reader. It's yes. up to the reader. And so, you know, with that, I just like to say thank you for coming on. Thank you for presenting this. Thank you for writing this book and for the many that will come, which I'm sure they will. And for our audience out there, please buy this, help Ara out, read it. Look at what for yourself what is going on here. The best way to support Ara and you know his writings is to buy this book. And so with that, I'd just like to uh, once again say thank you. I, I want my audience out there who's listening just to know there's, there is a lot of evil in the world. I, I, we all know that. But with books like this, you know, maybe the truth will prevail, and I believe that it will prevail. And so thank you. And thank you for having me.